All right, so, uh, so Alex's quote, which inspires him, I think it's important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy, by Elon Musk. So what does that mean to you? Can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. Um, so the first thing I want to say about my quote is that I didn't pick the quote because I love the quote as much as I love Elon Musk. So I just kind of picked an Elon Musk quote uh, to start with. But so the point of the quote, how many people have the Elon Musk uh, picked up that one? All right, good. So uh, what Elon's talking about in this quote is really trying to distinguish the idea of uh, being an innovator by looking at what other people are doing and figuring out how to do something similar to it versus building a company or a concept or a business model from the ground up and kind of going back to the very fundamentals of what makes a market work or the fundamentals of what makes a product work or the fundamentals of what makes a service work and working from that. And so using the fundamental to drive the idea, uh, which has resulted in his case in some of the most innovative stuff happening in the world right now. Uh, so that's why, that's why I like that quote so much. All right, so where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, very, 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 very northern Kentucky, almost Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what was your first exposure to entrepreneurship? Um, so the first thing I, re I can remember entrepreneurial, uh, doing entrepreneurially is uh, I was a treehouse builder in my backyard. So I grew up on a bunch of land. And so when I was like seven, I think, I started building tree houses. And, uh, and then started charging family and friends to visit them. Uh, so I was running a, uh, I was a real estate developer at seven. <laughs> that's, that's how I got my start, I think. Okay, and then that kind of inspired you a little bit. Tell us about your first company. Yeah, yeah, so, um, uh, so for a little background, I was, uh, so I went to the University of Louisville uh, for engineering and uh, met these two really brilliant guys when I was there. And uh, uh, they were both in, in uh, some of my engineering classes. And so we became friends first, and then we all kind of had this itch to start doing more outside of class, because uh, we were, uh, I think, fairly um, uh, dissatisfied, let's say, with uh, the amount of actual stuff we got to build in, in the classes. Um, hopefully a lot of people can identify with that. Um, <laughs> So we started uh, kind of meeting people around the city that were doing interesting stuff. Maybe they had a startup, maybe they were running a business, maybe they were um, doing their own thing or trying, trying to do their own thing in some cases. And we were inspired enough to start our own company which had uh, zero ideas. Um, and so our zero idea company uh, first started latching onto other people's ideas and just kind of offering our uh, engineering talent, what, however much of that there was at the time, uh, to help out. Because we just wanted to build stuff, we wanted to learn how people build things. So we started working with manufacturing companies to try and help them improve a process. We started working with medical device companies to try and design some little spring or a mechanic on something. We started working with uh, companies to build uh, custom electronics. Uh, we started building people's websites. Uh, and over time that turned into, snowballed into a consulting company uh, that we ran for about uh, three years uh, from like uh, 09 to uh, 2012. And then what happened? Uh, so we got kind of bored of doing services. Uh, so we were uh, kind of running the services model, having a lot of fun, I and mean, we were you know, learning how to build all this stuff, which was great. Uh, but we eventually got to the point where um, we wanted to build our own product, something we could get our hands on. And, um, and then we had ultimately the idea for, for Beam and sold the consulting company in late 2011 and then started Beam in 2012. Okay, so what was like the biggest lesson you took away from that business? Uh, from the first business? Yeah. So I think the, if, if I could go back and say what's the one thing that kind of separates Beam and my co-founders and our team and how, we, how we've built our team since then at, at Beam uh, based on an insight from that first company, it would be that finding people that love building stuff and know how to build stuff is, is fundamental. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, people think of that in the context of technology, so some, you know, software developer, you know. From our perspective, it's about 
no matter kind of what your role is at a great startup, you're building something. Uh, our first marketing guy is building a marketing program from scratch, right? Um, our designers are building our brand from scratch. Uh, and then certainly the engineers are building lots of, of brand new stuff or a brand new system for manufacturing of our software. And um, so people that really relish having nothing, the blank canvas, right, and then figuring out how to put that first line on paper that does something positive for the company. All right, so let's talk a little bit about me. Let's do it. How did you come up with this idea? Are you just brushing your teeth one day? And yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, well, they say all great ideas come in the bathroom, like in the shower <laughs> or uh, brush your teeth. Um, so I had a literal version of that happen. Um, so kind of the story behind me, um, which which I tell a lot actually because it's such a um, such a at first glance kind of a wacky idea and product uh, that. Uh, it, it kind of bears a little context, I think, for how we got started. So, in, back in that, that first company that I was just talking about, the consulting firm, one of the um, companies that, that we ended up doing some consulting work for uh, was a dental um, goods manufacturer. It just happens to be based in, in Louisville. Uh, and so we had met one of their owners at a, in an event or something. And they brought us on originally to redesign their website, and then we stayed on to do some work on their manufacturing, work, helping improve some uh, some testing processes that they had there. And uh, so we were doing that, and and that was about the time where we were like, all right, you know, we want to build our own product, right? And so I think because of that, we were um, thinking about the dental field, we were learning about the dental industry um, because of that because of that contract. So. As we were kind of learning about dentistry, we realized that, hey, there's a lot of stuff that's really messed up about uh, how the dental field operates, even at its core, some of the fundamentals, and this is true, you probably see this in, in healthcare stuff, just the way we administer, um, pay for, um, and distribute healthcare products and services in general is very backward, uh, very big, very tough to figure out. And what we noticed is that there's a ton of people trying to solve those problems in healthcare, right? Entrepreneurs that are uh, building, you know, new drugs in the pharmaceuticals industry, new medical devices, healthcare IT. There are practitioners trying to change uh, business models. Really interesting stuff. We look at the dental industry. There's like nothing happening. And now dental is not nearly as big as, as the rest of healthcare, but it's still a multi-hundred billion dollar industry. You know, it's a big deal. And so we we're like, man, there's certainly opportunities here to figure out how to connect people and the service providers they need, in this case, namely the dentist and the dental insurance company, together in a more elegant way, a more efficient way. And so using data that ultimately comes from Beam's uh, toothbrush and then our associated app allows us to kind of connect people into that ecosystem uh, without them having to lift a finger, which is a very non-negligible piece of that puzzle. So one thing that I discovered in doing my research is that you're named one of Forbes 30 under 30 for manufacturing. And obviously here in Ohio we have a strong... Picked me off a list. Let's close their eyes. And you're doing stuff that's connected to the internet. Some people call it internet of things, I call it maker tech. Sort of explain where this industry is in Ohio and if you see it kind of exploding and helping us bring back manufacturing. This is one of my favorite subjects, uh, and the reason is I have a very authentic and long-standing now interest in manufactured goods, uh, but also because um, the Midwest has a lot of disadvantages in the tech industry, so uh, that a lot of people here have probably felt those disadvantages directly. There's certainly far less venture capital here than the coast. There's less, uh, there are less people with computer science degrees, here than the coast. There are less people here that just understand what startups are and how they grow and how they move and what they do than on the coasts. Um, so for Midwestern states and cities, then the kind of next logical question is, what do we have an advantage in? And one of the answers is certainly manufacturing. Every talented person in the world in manufacturing is somewhere within a three or 400 mile radius of us right now. All the people that know plastics, 
And like the best people in plastics in the world are in cities like Columbus and Cleveland and Akron and Detroit and, uh, and cities like it, right? So, 400 companies, actually. Yeah, which is unbelievable, right? And so manufacturing becomes this kind of, to me, a no-brainer for like, how does the Midwest become competitive in, in the tech industry? And the answer is robotics, which are already a big deal in Pittsburgh and, and other markets in the Midwest. And uh, in manufactured goods, where the kind of fusion of software and manufacturing and hardware are, um, are perfect, a perfect storm for how the Midwest can very quickly catch up. So you're not just building, uh, uh, like in Louisville, I know we spend a lot of time talking about how do we attract software developers to, to Louisville, and you know, maybe it's horse races, maybe it's bourbon, maybe it's tourism, maybe it's our parks, or like, you know, the real answer is, are you trying to compete? In that way, in that head to head, and that in such a direct way, it's smarter to um, find something that Google's better than everybody else at. Um, Ohio is one of the best manufacturing states, if not the best, in the country. It's a, it's a no brainer for it to be focusing on these types of things. So, what's, what's your experience been working with government, good or bad, and the public, uh, and how can we as civic leaders? harness and shape and leverage this great manufacturing opportunity? So great question. So I think, uh, so I've, I've had a number of experiences in kind of the public private realm. Um, uh, certainly bo both of my companies have benefited from uh, publicly funded capital, um, whether in the form of a business plan, competition type of thing, or in some cases grants that are state supported. This would be Kentucky, of course. Um, and those are, are great programs. I think they're needed. I think in general they, they need to expand because uh, they make up a minuscule percentage of a state's budget, right? But you know, a minuscule percentage of a state's budget to a startup can be all that it takes, right? So, um, so I, I, you know, I'm in, in general very much in favor of and, and uh, a proponent for those types of models. Um, Specific to manufacturing, um, a state like Ohio can play a huge role uh, in kind of two ways. I think one is connections between those mom and pop shops that have no idea how to market themselves, that probably only the state really knows about, uh, would be very difficult for me to find. Um, but the state could help connect some dots, right? So if I said I really need a great plastics company uh, so I can purchase some material, purchase some um, um, machine time or something. Um, can you help me find that person? Uh, that would be a great resource, and it, it may exist ultimately uh, at the city level or at the state level. Uh, the other way would be providing, um, I mean you could even do this as an instrument, it doesn't necessarily have to be grant capital, but capital is either a grant, a debt instrument, um, something that would allow liquidity to make it really easy for manufacturing companies, uh, tax incentives could be a piece of that as well, to make it really easy for a manufacturing company to either move or expand their operation in an Ohio city, right? Um, and so if I say, all right, we're making you know, X number of products right now, um, we want to do X, we want to do 10X uh, in, in six months. Um, but we need to buy you know, this machine, this machine, this machine, we need to you know, do a training program, you know, hire 10 people, um, the resources to help us find those 10, providing capital for the training, um, financing for the equipment, um, that stuff would be tremendous because even for the most well-funded startups among us, those are still some costs that make it tough to create those jobs, tough to uh, produce those goods and bring the tax revenue back to the state. And it costs relatively little to do. I mean, you might be talking about investments that are you know, low six-digit numbers that can be extremely meaningful in the future term. Future term. And, and then something that Ohio knows about. So it's like very familiar territory for people in this area. So I see the uh, Luxdan folks in the audience. And uh, obviously, uh, it makes me think about the idea of millennials. And you're a millennial entrepreneur. Yes. Talk to us a little bit about your experience as an entrepreneur coming to Columbus. I know that you're you're a very big deal in Louisville as an organizer of the Louisville startup community. 
and that's very obvious when you just do like some cursory searches and stuff like that. So, so do things like what you're doing. Google. Google. I get to host this. Thing. Do it, yeah, it's awesome. Um, so for context, I've been in Columbus about six months, and uh, uh, yeah, this is my seventh month here. Um, and I love it so far. I mean, I think Columbus is a super, super vibrant city. Um, yeah. I think one of my biggest fears about moving the company, not to Columbus, but just moving it in general, was if we had to move it, could it be moved to a place that was as vibrant um, as, as a place like Louisville, which is kind of on the ground, you know, really aggressively growing and startup scene, hosting great events and uh, uh, recruiting new companies and growing uh, new exciting things. Um, you know, I bet the angel capital available in Louisville has quadrupled in the past three years. Um, and so could we essentially get something that, that felt a lot like that? Uh, and I think Columbus ticks all these boxes. I mean, I think we've seen, I mean, just the response tonight, right, there's 200 plus people committed to the event, right? Like, it's amazing, right? It is tough to get. It, it, it would be tough to suggest that a city of Columbus's size uh, could draw uh, a crowd specific to a startup topic with with that type of ease. If if there weren't a lot already happening here, if there wasn't already a great base of entrepreneurs, if there weren't already tons of investors looking for the next deal, if there weren't a lot of people that want to become entrepreneurs, they're trying to learn more about it and meet people. Um, and so I think the, the vibrancy of the city is very apparent, especially from a startup perspective. Um, and I think the support infrastructure, one thing that uh, we were just kind of talking about on the side here, is uh, the public-private partnerships that exist here are incredible. I mean, that's something I've never seen in another city. Uh, um, I think that's really, that's a nice applause line. That's an applause line. You know, uh, I think it's easy to suggest that like mid-sized companies that have you know started in Columbus, always been in Columbus type things, would be a part of those kind of community-driven programs, but not your nationwide and your chases and your you know the multinationals. Uh, so that, you know the fact that they're very active and Carbon Health is the same way um, is impressive, super impressive. So if you have a question, um, just go to engage.civicacts.org from your phone and uh, put in your name and write your question and uh, we'll ask those here in a minute. So again, that's engage.civicacts.org. And uh, Kevin Mack, if you're here, if you can bring me that iPad. <laughs> that would be helpful. Please ask tons of questions. So, so what motivates you as an entrepreneur? So, so motivation is a really interesting question for uh, startup people because because um, there are so many reasons to. So, if you're doing a startup, how many people here are doing a startup right now? Who own a couple? Okay, nice. good, good, really good, good. nice. Um, so, if you're doing a startup, there until you're like, I don't know. Until you're doing maybe 10 million a year in revenue, like something pretty extreme, uh, there are always more reasons to quit than keep going. Like always, like a lot more reasons to quit than keep going. Uh, there's some uh, amount of insanity in just getting going to begin with, and then the premise that you like keep doubling down on that insanity, uh, like for a long time, like every month you're, you like read up and like yeah I want to continue to do this, it's crazy, it's absurd, and. Um, and so I think the, the motivation uh, for many people over time becomes um, a really central question to like why you're doing what you're doing. Um, waking up on the campaign trail every day, like you probably wake up like, why am I doing this? Right? Like, you have to really go back to the fundamentals of like, what, what's the end game, what's the goal, what really, really gets me excited um, about this, what am I so passionate about that I will not leave this uh, the kind of consequences of, of the decisions that you make to do something uh, like a startup. And uh, for me, it's always been about um, my co-founders. You know, we're on our second company together. Uh, they're my best friends. I've lived with both of them uh, for different periods of time. Uh, still live with one of them currently. Uh, so, I mean, I see this guy 
18 hours a day, every day for the past five, six years, right? So at some point you're doing it more for them than you're doing it even for yourself, um, which I think is a big piece of it. Um, the other major motive uh, for us is, is the premise of impact. So especially in, in, if you're doing something um, in healthcare, for example, it becomes really easy to see the consequences of your effort. Um, touching people in a very meaningful way, and not just meaningful like, hey, I log into your app a few times a day and it's really cool, uh, which, which is in its own right awesome and incredible and rare, um, but going to our app to maybe for the first time be able to access cost-effective dental services for long overdue uh, oral health work is like a huge deal, and so you start to see that um, model being replicated and you know, first one guy has that experience and loves it, and then 10 people, and then 100 people, and then 1,000 people, and pretty soon uh, it's easy to be very excited and very motivated by the impact that you're having. All right, so we're going to turn to the questions. Please, so we've, uh, the fun stuff. collecting from the audience. I'm done with your questions. So uh, we'll start with a quick one. Clara asks, what kind of toothpaste do you use? <laughs> um, uh, I've got a great answer for this. So I currently, I'm going to answer this three ways. Classically, I use Crest, uh, Procter & Gamble, an Ohio company, there you go. Uh, classically, I use Crest. Currently, I use a boutique manufacturer called Dentise uh, that, our, that has this just incredible toothpaste that our company is considering uh, uh, purchasing right now. And uh, in about two more months, I will be using uh, Beam's own toothpaste. We're going to be launching our own in uh, uh, May. So John asks, where can I buy your toothbrush? Easy question. Uh, so our toothbrush is uh, sold online. So the Beam brush is at beamtoothbrush.com. Uh, and it's just 29 bucks. Uh, so it's $29 for a connected sonic-powered toothbrush with tons of bells and whistles, which is uh, growing, growing by the day, actually. So. Great deal. Johnny asks, were you ever afraid of failure? If so, how did you address it? Uh, I am currently, at this moment, afraid of failure. Uh, have been more or less consistently since 2009. Um, and how do I deal with it? Um, uh, bourbon helps. Um, and a, I think I, kind of back to the motives question, I'm constantly revisiting why I'm doing what I'm doing. I think any good entrepreneur has a really good answer to the why question. If you don't have a good answer to the why question, quit your startup immediately and go back to the rest of the world where you can have a much easier lifestyle and probably, you know, make more money and do all that stuff, right? So like, always have a really good answer to like, why am I doing this right now? And um, I'm very, I feel very lucky in that my co-founders and I have always been able to very easily answer the why question. So your, your fear of failure is, is, is healthy, it's a survival instinct. Um, outside of that, it, it's, it's functional. Well, it's all about evolution. So, what has some of the failures how do you approach entrepreneurship differently today than they five years ago? Um, so I would say, uh, if, if people couldn't hear the question, it was how do I approach um, um, entrepreneurship and kind of the premise of failure, etc., differently as a result of failures that we have incurred over over time, and um, and, and we certainly have. So. Um, as a, as a quick story, uh, I was raising my first seed round. Have a lot of people here done like like a finance startup? How many people here have like raised money successfully for a startup? A few people. So if you've ever been through the startup financing process, it's brutal because nobody's idea has anything but holes in it when you're pitching it the first time, right? Like your business is weak. It doesn't have enough users. It doesn't have enough traction. It doesn't have. I mean. You're in the classic catch-22, you need money to grow, you don't have money to do it, and so you're just in this constant loop until you can trick somebody into spending money on you. And um, so we were raising our first seed round uh, in, uh, in Louisville, in, so this is 20, late 2012, and there was a really prominent angel investor 
uh, maybe the most like well-known angel investor in Louisville's market, um, who, unlike some other investors who are lesser influential, let's say, he was not a fan of our company, uh, whether it was you know, personal reasons, just didn't like the business, whatever, right? So he just had enough reasons to say no that he started telling the very small group of angel investors in Louisville at the time that he wasn't going to do the deal and no one else should either, right? So this has been my life's work. This is what I do like 15 hours a day and well, alongside these two guys that, you know, have no idea who any of these people are, right? And I'm going into rooms like this, uh, I'll be in much smaller with less people, pitching endlessly this ridiculous toothbrush idea that's already a long shot to begin with because I'm raising venture capital in Kentucky for a toothbrush. And so I'm like, I'm already playing from like six levels in the hole, right? And then on top of that, the one guy who you would like to be on your team, kind of jazzing up the deal, uh, isn't a fan, and he's poisoning it in the back room whenever he talks to people. Um, so we had to um, totally evolve how we were talking about the business. Um, we played a really strong angle that had very little to do with the company, a lot more to do with uh, the, you know some of these things we're talking about now, manufacturing and researching um, uh, physical goods and all this stuff. Um, in order to just have a coherent enough story to be able to raise money around. Because we had people that on kind of the, the, the essence of our ideas with dental insurance, with dental services, just did not want any part of it. And, um, but that's what great entrepreneurs figured out. And so we were able to kind of limp our way to the finish line for a seed round, and now we're one of the uh, Midwest best funded companies. You know? So I mean, you know, figuring out how to make that happen, it, uh, it took a long time and there were a lot of, a lot of mistakes made in, in doing it, for sure. All right, well, uh, let's give it a bit.